Good evening, everyone. I'm glad this is on. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you to the museum, and thank you to Anne and the Cat Center for having us. Um, we're going to start with uh, opening statements from everyone on the panel, starting with Shaul. Thanks to Ear and to Anne and to the Cat Center and to all of you for coming out. I know there are a lot of other things that you could be doing. Um, I want to begin by saying that um, I understand or recognize that uh, there's a very, probably a very wide political spectrum here in the room and um, that what I'm going to say is not meant to be partisan in particular or certainly not to be um, offensive to any one political view, but I just want to make a series of observations on the relationship between American Jews and Israel today and go back and look from a historical perspective how that has come to be and what are some of the interesting kind of ironies and paradoxes that exist. I actually want to start with something that Anne said. Um, uh, in a certain way, it kind of encapsulates everything that I want to say. So the short anecdote, not really an anecdote, but all of you know that um, the statement of the Holocaust Memorial Day from the White House, um, there were a few things that were absent in that statement. Um, the most prominent being, of course, the mention of Jews, the genocide of the Jews during the Shoah, during the Holocaust. Um, and intentional or not, I mean, as I, as I understand that, that, the, that the administration has come out and said that it actually was intentional and gave a reason as to why, but I don't really want to go into that now because that's not really what interests me. What interests me is a statement that Ron Lauder, many of you know, very important Jewish philanthropist and um, Jewish activist in America, a statement that he made when he was asked about uh, what he thought about the fact that uh, the Jews were not mentioned in this Holocaust Memorial Statement. And what Lauder said was that we shouldn't be making such a big deal about it, that it wasn't done with any malice, and there certainly isn't any intention against the Jews because, of course, um, President Trump is a big friend of Israel. That was the statement that he made. It's a very interesting statement if you take that apart. Right? In other words, um, because the president is a friend of Israel, there's somehow an excuse that he intentionally or perhaps mistakenly, I don't know which is worse, failed to mention the Jews in making a White House statement at the Holocaust Memorial Day. And in some way, that encapsulates everything that I wanted to say. The way in which where we are today as a community is that the notion of, uh, of Israel has effaced all other aspects of Jewish identity. As if to say, it's okay that we don't mention the Jews as long as you're a friend of Israel. As long, we, don't have to, we can cut the Jews out of the Holocaust, but if you're a friend of Israel, that's somehow okay. So I want to make four points. Um, the first point is to investigate um, Louis Brandeis's famous statement, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with, um, that being a good Zionist is being a good American. Right? That was said back in the teens, maybe the early 20s. Now, what Brandeis was actually trying to um, address was the notion of dual allegiance that Jews were being accused of in the early part of the 20th century. That actually goes back to the emancipation of the Jews in France in the early part of the 18th century, but became particularly an issue once Zionism became more prominent in the early 20th century. That is, how can Jews have an allegiance both to the United States and to another country? And what Brandeis was trying to do was trying to say, actually, there is no tension of dual allegiance because, in a way, being a good American is being a good Zionist, being a good Zionist is being a good American. Fine. We can, we can, we can argue with that, um, but it's an interesting way of trying to solve a problem. Where have we come with that today? Uh, two things. One of the things that broke that apart was, the, was Prime Minister Netanyahu's uh, uh, um, uh, speaking to the United States Congress against a standing president on the Iran question, forgetting about whether you think about uh, what you think about the Iran deal. That itself did something that American Jews always were afraid of. Don't put us in a position to choose. That's number one. Second, some of you may know that um, uh, years ago, I don't know if it's still true today, but years ago there was a very popular bumper sticker. 
And the bumper sticker said, during the I Love New York campaign back in the 90s, or maybe it was in the 80s, I don't know. 70s, okay, oh gosh, okay. <laughs> anyway, in the aftermath of the uh, I Love New York campaign, there was a bumper sticker that said, I love New York, but Jerusalem is my home. Right? Now, it's a kind of, you'd think it's a kind of nice thing to say, but think about it for a moment, what that actually means. What would happen, for example, if you're driving your car and, 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 and you, know, you stop at a light and you have a bumper sticker, I, I'm from, I'm from the, I love New York and Jerusalem, my home, and somebody rolls down the window and says, go home. You would say, it's anti-Semitism. And he would say, it's on the back of your car. Right? So there's a way in which we, we somehow don't really feel the, the sense of, of, of the problem, the tension of dual allegiance the way we once felt. And what does that mean? That's point number one. Point number two, I think that what, um, uh, what I find as a professor at a university and someone that speaks around the country is that when, Jew, when American Jews talk about being Zionists, most of the time they're actually not talking about being Zionists. They're talking about being pro-Israelists, which is something that's not the same. Right? Zionism is a very complicated ideology of Jewish identity that has been at war with itself from the beginning. Right? We can talk about the history of Zionism. Most people who claim to be very, very ardent Zionists really don't know very little about Zionism. Right? They know about some of the names of the people because there are streets in Tel Aviv named Pinsker Street, so they know there's a Pinsker, they know there's a Berdachevsky. Right? But they don't really, they don't really it's about advocacy. It's not about a much more complicated cultural, national project of Zionism. Point number three. Where have we come as a, as a community from prominent American figures like Louis Brandeis, like St Stephen Wise, like Joachim Prince, some of the great Zionists of the early 20th century, who were the most influential in forming what American Zionism is, to people like David Friedman and Jared Kushner? It's an interesting trajectory. You know, where are we, right? Where are we when Joachim Prince, as a Zionist, stood up in 1963 at the, at the Washington Memorial and gave a speech before Martin Luther King who claimed that his advocacy of civil rights was a part of his Zionism. Right. So that's another question to ask in terms of this trajectory where in a certain way we've moved from Zionism as having a humanistic, nationalistic, being a part of humanist and nationalist project to be, being a kind of of uh, a, a, a stark advocate of an ethnocentric country in a place that American Jews choose not to live in. Right? That is what Israel is for American Jews. It's the country they choose not to live in. Right? What is that relationship? Number four, what is the relationship between Christian America and American Zionism? There's a very interesting thing that's happened. If we go back to the early part of the century, up until the 1960s, the Christian Christian, the communities that were the most strongly supportive of Jews, the most outspoken against anti-Semitism, were mainline Protestants. Right. The evangelical community at that time was harboring a lot of old anti-Semitic attitudes. Right? It was the mainline Protestants, it was Reinhold Niebuhr, and those other individuals who strongly spoke against the Jews, uh, spoke against, anti, uh, against uh, um, discrimination against the Jews. The whole thing has flipped upside down. The evangelicals are now our friends, and the mainline Protestants, many of whom are supporting BDS, some of whom, some of whom are supporting BDS, some of whom are supporting the uh, pro-Palestinian positions or critique of Israel, have become our enemies. But it's not because the evangelicals love the Jews. It's because the evangelicals love Israel for very, very particular reasons. So I think what's interesting to see about the trajectory about where we are as American Jews today is we are now actually being supported with the very people who were considered to be our adversaries. And we consider our adversaries the very people who are, were our supporters. Right? And I think this goes to the, to the you know, final thing that I want to say, which is that Jewishness and Judaism in America ha is in the danger of being faced by a position regarding Israel, which, as I said again, and I want to reiterate, the country we choose not to live in. As much as we may love it, as much as we may support it, right? 
Joachim Prinz said very clearly that in a situation, and as a Zionist, that in a situation where when somebody asked him what if America was pitted against Israel, hypothetically, right? The, the, the nightmare nobody wants to really uh, speak about. As a, as a Zionist, Joachim Prinz said, of course, Jews in America would side with America. I don't think that's necessarily true anymore. And what does that actually mean? And finally, I want to end with a very, very short, have I gone over my time? Okay, a very short anecdote. Some of you may, be, may have seen it, some of you may not, but it's actually fascinating. Richard Spencer, who is the, the, the founder of a white nationalist movement, gave a talk at Texas A&M University a couple of months ago. It's, on, it's, it's gone viral on YouTube. Well, not viral, like Jew viral. It's a different kind of viral. Um, and um, Matt Rosenberg, who was the rabbi at Texas A&M Hillel, gets up to ask Spencer a question after Spencer, you know, and he says, my tradition, meaning Judaism, my tradition is, 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 is uh, supportive of radical inclusion. Will you sit down and learn Torah with me and learn about radical inclusion? And Spencer thought for a moment and he said, really? Judaism is about radical inclusion. Well, what would you think if all the people in the Middle East decided to move to Jerusalem and Tel Aviv? Is that the kind of radical inclusion you want? And then he went on to say that he, he admires the Jews precisely because they were never into radical inclusion. And that what he wants to create, this is Spencer, I'm not supporting this position, but what Spencer said, what he wants to create in America is what Israel created in Israel. He wants an ethno-national state of white Christian Americans. And he said to, 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 this, to this rabbi, you have your country over there. I want exactly what you have over here. Elsewhere, he's defined his white nationalist movement as white Zionism. Now, what does that actually mean? Forgetting about Spencer for a minute, what does that actually mean that a white nationalist can, can look at Zionism in the 21st century and say, yes, that is what I want to reproduce in America? That's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you for all coming out, and thank you to the museum and to my fellow panelists. Um, I can't wait for the discussion because just about everything you said I disagreed with. Um, and that's why we're here, to disagree and to disagree civilly and hopefully with some factual basis. Um, I live and work in Washington, D.C. I'm not an academic. So I report I analyze, and for decades now, I think it's been evident that there have been three trends going on in American politics and Jewish American politics. One is that their support for political candidates has nothing whatsoever to do with Israel. I take exactly the opposite view, that American Jews are motivated not at all by Israel, but by a set of humanistic social justice norms that are now being severely tested. And it's at this point in history that Jewish Americans are really gonna be tested, not because of dual loyalty, but because of conviction to a set of humanistic principles, to democracy, to tolerance, um, to a whole set of social values. I'm sorry. So that would be number one. Number two, we have gone through a revolution in Jewish and Christian um, relations, and it may well now flip. What had been an effort and some healing of the rift between the long history of animosity between organized Christianity and Jewish communities had been ameliorating somewhat over time. Because the evangelical population, for reasons I'd love to discuss, because that's a fascinating subject in and of itself, have decided to so strongly support Donald Trump for many of the reasons that Jews do not, and for that same set of social 
moral principles. There may very well be a return to real hostility between the Christian community and the Jewish community. I don't say that as a good thing or a bad thing, simply as an observation. Third, American Jews, unlike, I think, Jews of Europe, have not experienced directly anti-Semitism in its most virulent, obvious form for many decades. Very good to be here at the museum. I actually hadn't been here before, so I took a couple hours to walk around. It's quite eerie. Whether you go to 1917 or you go to 1924, go to the Palmer Raids, you go to World War I, you go to the Jews of the 1930s who generally did not want to make too much of a fuss. We have a long and very difficult relationship between American politics, anti-Semitism, and American Jewry. How vocal do we become? Do we not want to make a fuss? Perfectly illustrated by Mr. Lehman's comments. Don't want to make a fuss. Don't want to stick your head up. Maybe slam down. And that is going to be tested severely as we now have not a fringe group like Mr. Spencer, but you have someone in the West Wing. You have people who harbor this very crude form of populism, which is inherently anti-Semitic, I would argue, um, because it has a blood and soil um, <laughs> philosophy at its base. Those people are inside the White House now. So it is going to take, I think, um, some shaking off of the lethargy uh, and some coordination with the non-Jewish community, which is always going to be more important in the political sense because there are more of them. Um, and it is going to, I think, require some very interesting alliances, which I've been exploring in my writing and reporting on between right and left, between people who have not much in common other than fidelity to democratic norms, tolerance, belief in the Constitution. So I think those three themes um, are kind of circling one another, and they've come together spectacularly, um, if I can describe that like a, a car crash is spectacular, um, in the past couple of days in particular, but of course throughout the campaign. The question, I think, before American Jewry is not whether Israel or any other foreign policy issue is going to be primary. It is whether their values as Jews, just as in the civil rights movement of the 1960s, will compel them to step forward, to show civic leadership, and to express a solidarity with people who are being marginalized, demonized. It's a test of our values as Jews and whether we are willing to stick our heads up in the public square to express them. So I think it's a fascinating and awful time all at once. Um, but I also think um, that it is a unique opportunity because the phrase a light unto nations is overused and under, misunderstood. But in this case, I think it is not. And I think because of Jews' particular experience in America, because of their history, because of their identity, have something in particular to offer to America at this very troubling time. Thanks, I wanna thank Anne and, and the museum. And um, I feel as if I'm sitting among giants. These are some of the people whose writings 
I most respect, and I um, am grateful for the opportunity to step out from the daily, I wouldn't even just call it daily, it's minute by minute um, sort of um, immersion into this new political reality and think about the question, the state of Jewish politics. And in fact, I think the state of Jewish politics should cause us to think about the state. And I'm a historian, and so I think about these things in a historical way. Um, I want to offer a sort of very basic thesis, which is that the chief engine of Jewish politics in our country is what I call, in a book that I'm working on, the American Jewish Philanthropic Complex. And the way I understand the complex is that it stitches concepts of value, both monetary and moral, individuality and collectivity into a structure of rationality. That, that is, it makes sense. Uh, it feels rational because it occludes other possible forms of organization and decision making, and also because its assumptions, the assumptions of this complex of Jewish philanthropy, have been validated through Jewish history and traditions, and also through American legal and political and economic history and policy. So I'm not going to spend that much time right now talking about Jewish philanthropy in the Jewish historical or textual context, because I want to train our eyes to look at the American state and the relationship between the state, that is our, our government and our policies and our economic models, and the kinds of politics that Jews engage in. Um, and the first thing I think that we need to understand is that American Jewish philanthropy exists at the intersection of the American state and the collective, the group. It takes its shape from state regulations applied to what in the 19th century was called associational life, right? Those, those associations, those groups that collective individuals would form together. And through policies of legal incorporation and taxation developing in the 19th century, states both encouraged and regulated this form of the association, the kind of form of what would the status of the collective be in a country where citizenship was based upon the individual. Um, and groups that adhered to these different state laws about incorporation and about taxation, they would gain rewards of legal protection, and they most importantly in the 19th century would gain um, the, the kind of benefit of exemption from property taxation. The state's relationship to philanthropy, I would argue, is most visible through tax policy. And by the state, now I mean the federal government, starting in 1913 when the federal government uh, passes an income tax, a federal income tax, and that through taxation practices, I know tax law is not usually thought of as something really fascinating, and I am here to evangelize. <laughs> Tax policy is fascinating. Uh, through taxation, this, the federal government encouraged and disciplined private acts on behalf of the public good, okay? And they did so by doling out tax expenditures or tax benefits. Philanthropic organizations can get these benefits to this day as long as they adhere to certain state norms. The state subsidizes philanthropy with its public revenue. Right? We have to understand this. So when somebody, when, when Ron, Ron Lauder has a Lauder Foundation, part of the corpus of that foundation is public revenue. It does so in the form of tax exemptions to organizations and of course deductions to individuals. Okay, so that's the biggest framing. Therefore, Jewish politics, as I'm defining it in the form of Jewish philanthropy, itself is deeply embedded in the structures and forms of the American state. And one manifestation of this is looking at how Jewish philanthropy is sort of inscribed with the same kinds of inequalities that we know exist in broader state policies, right? We know from the work of a number of different political scientists and economists that the American, American state policy has exacerbated and sort of amplified income inequality by particular policies, especially post uh, 1960, 1970. And that means shifting resources into the pockets of the highest earners and away from mass redistribution. And there's lots of data and statistical portraits that show how this works in concert with state policies and especially with policies of taxation. So when we trace the distributional policies of American philanthropy and my own research of American Jewish philanthropy, 
we see really the same kinds of patterns tracking really closely to the same years of that growing inequality gap in the United States. Massive and unprecedented aggregation of philanthropic resources that are not matched by their circulation or their redistribution. And this is most evident if we're to zoom into looking at Jewish philanthropy, though this exists in the wider world of philanthropy. It's most evident in the tremendous growth of Jewish philanthropic endowments, perpetual funds, right? That's about aggregation, it's not about circulation. So, if we're at a moment when the nature of the state is changing rapidly, which I believe we are, we have to ask how will this age of Trump challenge or undermine what I've described as this American Jewish philanthropic complex, and thus how will it challenge and undermine something of Jewish politics? Now, whether one thinks about a state moving toward a kind of totalitarian mindset or a state moving toward a very privatized mindset, in either of these most extreme cases, whether you have a, a, a state that is fully in control of everything, or you have a state that has, is so small that it outsources all of the kinds of things we might think of a state doing, in either of those models, there's not the space for what I've defined as the association, right? That can only exist if the state carves out space between the government and the private sector. In a massive state, the government becomes everything, and in a private state, the government becomes nothing. And in either of these scenarios, you do not have that space for the collective vis-a-vis -vis associations. Philanthropic institutions, I would argue, could be our best hope for maintaining, even if just briefly, that shrinking ground between the government and the private sector. And this would mean using their historic shape that I've described and the resources that they've gained through structures of state-based inequality to resist the erosion of state responsibility to the public good. This, though, can only be the case if philanthropic institutions own their histories and own their power and their deep indebtedness to American statecraft and its structural inequalities. So the question that I have coming into this is will Jewish philanthropic institutions step up to a new public role and own their power? Will this become a vehicle for a new Jewish politics? And I'll offer my speculation for what it's worth. The vast majority of Jews we know did not vote for Trump, but the most powerful institutions of Jewish life have been very, very enriched by the inequalities of state-based associationalism. And I fear that some of them have become very entrenched in those inequalities, most notably through the heft of their endowments, which rely upon policies that have uh, encouraged aggregation over circulation. And I wonder if they're going to be able to pivot to our new reality, which will demand, I would argue, capital expenditure, not aggregation, and which will demand constant and unrelenting articulation of power wherever and however one has it to resist the basest impulses of xenophobia, white supremacy, isolationism, and hatred. Instead, I worry that the wealthiest Jewish philanthropic organizations have continued to carry on with incredible self-contradiction in how they use and understand their political power, that on one hand, they disavow their power to do anything in response to Trump. We, we are not political, we're not partisan. On the other hand, they justify that disavowal by a strategic shoring up of power for some future moment. And they refuse, or are very slow, I would say, to expend their political capital just as they have refused or been very slow to expend their economic capital held in endowment funds and other perpetual funds. And thus, they position themselves, in a sense, as defending a kind of status quo, whatever that might be, walls, bans on refugees, anti-Muslim immigration laws, the evisceration of public education, the denial of climate change, and more. And indeed, such a position must be identified as an exercise of power, and in this case, the power to legitimate and assist Trump's rule. Um, does this work? Yes. yes? Oh, first of all, I want to thank the uh, CAT Center. I want to thank the uh, Feinstein Program, the uh, uh, Schottenstein Chair, and the Friedman Chair, and the Ross Building, and the Kimmel Center. Um, 
My father told me once that um, Israel, you know about this business with uh, Netanyahu and the submarines from Germany. It's a bit of a scandal that they bought. But <clears throat> my father said that they actually built a dry dock to build vessels in Haifa years ago. It didn't work. The first boat that went off the dry dock sank to the middle of Haifa Harbor because uh, it was weighted down by all the plaques. <laughs> <clears throat> so I am going to, uh, I was thinking of talking about Israeli security and American Jews, which is mostly what I write about these days, but I've been struggling with a kind of a larger thought, which is too big for here, so I'm going to lay it out telegraphically and leave out some key supporting material so I can sort of explain the large picture. I'll start by saying that in 1992, I was at, that's 25 years ago, whew, I was um, at the General Assembly of Jewish Philanthropies, of Jewish Federations, and the last morning there's a, um, a resolution session which only the elected delegates can go to, 800 out of the 4,000 people who attend. And um, that morning in 1992, they passed uh, resolutions putting the Jewish community, the Jewish philanthropic community, on record in favor of single-payer national health care, of uh, labor uh, law reform to encourage unions, um, of tax uh, reform in order to tax the wealthy to strengthen welfare. Um, it was a shocking wake-up moment because you don't associate those things, but you go back through the records, and that was the position of the major Jewish organizations for years going back to the 1920s or before. Um, the chairman of that session was Max Fisher, who was a former president of the Council of Jewish Federations, former national chairman of the UJA, former national president, the first chairman of the Jewish Agency for Israel, um, and the finance chairman of the Nixon campaign in 1968. And so I went up to him and I said, um, what does it feel like for you as a leading Republican to be sitting here and chairing what amounts to a convention of the Socialist Party? And he smiled and he shrugged and he said, those are my people. You cannot imagine a situation like that today and there are several specific reasons. Um, first of all, two mega changes over the last half century. In 1972, um, Jewish Republicans, led by Max Fisher, predicted that that was the year Jews, because of McGovern, would uh, switch to the Republican Party. Uh, the Commentary Magazine and Padharitz and the whole neoconservative movement was very active in that confident, uh, it didn't happen. McGovern did get the lowest percentage of any Democrat among Jews since um, Stevenson, which was 65%. Um, that was low. But the Jews went for the Democrat in 72 and again in 76 and every year since. Um, Carter was the only Democrat since before World War I, I think, um, to get less than a majority of the Jews, but he still got a plurality, a big plurality. Um, over the years, as Republicans have gotten more and more frustrated with the failure of Jews to vote Republican, to vote in what Republicans thought of as Jewish interests, they began to agitate not for Jews to switch their votes, but for the Jewish community as an institution to stop talking about domestic issues. Uh, you hear all the time, what does abortion have to do with Judaism? What does um, tax policy or um, equal rights or, or civil rights have to do with Judaism? What is, uh, I mean, separation of church and state simply keeps money away from day schools, which everybody agrees are the vehicle for um, preserving Jewish identity, even though they're, uh, they attract almost 100% of Orthodox kids and close to 0% of everybody else. 5%, um, I think. So there's been this conscious effort to redefine with some success what is a Jewish public agenda. This hasn't changed the minds of the Jews. It has simply helped Jews over the last, since 72, what's that, 45 years, to view the institutional Jewish community as having less and less to do with them, taking less and less interest, and therefore having even less influence on them. So it's a, a mutual issue of separation between the two. We use the phrase Jewish community interchangeably to mean the Jews, and the Jewish organizations that speak for them. Um, they are two very different animals, and if we don't separate those two issues, we get very confused very quickly. 
Second big change in the last half century came in 1994 when uh, Bill Clinton lost the House of Representatives and Newt Gingrich uh, instituted what you might call the Gingrich Re Revolution, which was the principle that Republicans do not agree to lose. N majority doesn't rule anymore, and um, there's no such thing as being outvoted. Now, this has been reflected in the behavior of the Republicans on Capitol Hill ever since. We saw it under McConnell in the um, Senate, but it's been reflected very strongly in the Jewish community. It, you, there's no more Max Fishers. There are no more Max Fishers. The biggest example I can think of happened immediately afterwards when Gingrich introduced a balanced budget amendment to the uh, Congress. Didn't go anywhere, but um, the head of the Washington office of the Council of Jewish Federations recommended to the council that it get into the fight against the balanced budget amendment because there were between four and eight billion dollars going from the federal government through Jewish institutions in anti-poverty, in old age, in uh, health care, um, Jewish hospitals, Jewish homes for the aged, and um, all of that was at risk. And five donors in three cities, five multi-million dollar donors vetoed the whole thing. If you go along with this, if you go against Gingrich, you lose my gift. And the New York Federation quickly backed off, the Chicago Federation shut it down in the Atlanta Federation, and that was the end of it. Because these five very wealthy people said, you lose my gift. And the federations saw the gift as too valuable. There were too many people working for that money, supported by that money, getting their payrolls from that money. Um, so those are the two big issues. One is the attempt and failure and frustration of Jewish Republicans to get the Jewish community to switch and unable to do that to shut it down. The second one was the general tendency beginning on the right, I don't see it so far among the Democrats, even though there's people pushing them for it, to dismiss the idea of being outvoted. Now let me change the subject very briefly. The, um, the most surprising number, which is surprisingly undiscussed, in 1990, 1990, the National Jewish Population Survey electrified the country by showing that 52% of American Jews who got married were marrying non-Jews. Slightly more than half. It turned out it was a little bit less than half, but it doesn't matter. It was half, now it's something like 80% among non-Orthodox Jews. 57% if you include the Orthodox. Um, and the survey also found that among intermarried couples, how are you planning on raising your children? 28% said Jewish, 20% 20 said Christian, and 52%, and the number keeps on coming up again, um, were saying either both or neither. So 28% were gonna raise their kids as Jewish. Fast forward 30 years to 2013, is that 30 years, 25 years? Doesn't matter, um, 23 years. The Pew survey of American Jews, Jewish Americans, found that among children of intermarriage, 60% identify themselves as Jews. Which means 28% of them want, were raised by their parents to be Jewish, but somehow something went wrong and 60% grew up Jewish. So the reason that the Jewish community has, to everybody's surprise, grown is because, look, if, um, if two Jews marry each other and have one child, you get one child out of it. If two Jews each marry a Gentile and they each have one child and 50% identify as Jews, you get the same one Jew. You break even. <laughs> so once it's 60%, you're a growing community. And that's what we are. And a large proportion of those people are Jews in a different sense. First of all, half of their family is not Jewish, celebrates Christmas. Even if they identify deeply as a Jew, they have a very hard time, if at all, identifying non-Jews as the other. They're the other half of their family. So that's redefining American Judaism in a very profound sense. Um, but more important, what is it that caused so many Jews who weren't raised to be Jews? People with one Jewish parent, just a Jewish father, for example. They've been taught that they're not Jewish, and yet they call themselves Jewish. 
Here's where I'm going to go out on a limb a little bit and say, over the last generation, being Jewish has become cool. Seinfeld, John Stewart, Sarah Silverman. I could go back to Woody Allen and Mel Brooks and um, Barbara Streisand. There's some Henry Kissinger. Being Jewish is hip. It is elite. It is a way of identifying yourself with a literate, sophisticated, cosmopolitan, and very chic group of people. So that has helped us, our deep integration into American society. And the willing, remember, Milton Berle dominated American comedy in the 1950s, but he changed his name from Berlinsky. George Burns had been Nathan Birnbaum. Um, um, Sophie Tucker had been Sophie Kalish, and so on and so on and so on. Now, Jerry Seinfeld is Jerry Seinfeld. John Stewart, well, he's a bad example. Um, <laughs> Sarah Silverman, Matis Yahoo. Um, there are so many examples of, um, of Jews who publicly parade themselves, half Jews, well, half Jews, um, Michael Douglas, Kirk's son, he's combatively Jewish. He's interviewed on, by Israeli media about the uh, studios and about directing and so on, and he comes on the attack and says, how dare you call me not Jewish, just because my mother's not Jewish. It's a fascinating thing to read those interviews. Unfortunately, they're in Hebrew. But, um, <laughs> but if you know some Hebrew or you got a friend who can read it, go back in Haaretz. Um, so we have a, now, so what's the problem now? The, the third big change right now is that being Jewish is becoming unappealing. I would say that there are three reasons for this. Very quickly, there is the growth of anti-Semitism, uh, anti-Israel activism, which makes many Jews feel uncomfortable. They don't know enough about Israel. When they're told that Israel expelled a million, uh, 750,000 Arabs, all these things that Israel actually does, they, they never heard that. So they're silenced, they're embarrassed. And it's so uncool these days. My kids are both in college. And, they t and they're active Zionists, and they tell me how hard it is um, to open your mouth when people call you a racist and a fascist and thing like that. Um, and since almost all American Jewish kids go to college now, it's the formative years, when the identity shaping years are years when being Jewish is hard. Item number two, you read about Israel in the newspaper, and because Israel is the primary focus of public Jewish identity these days, um, when you read, look, when a tank opens fire on a teenager with a rock, there's no way to make it look good. There's no way. It may be that there's a very good reason why the tank had to open fire, or simply face the kid and scare him. Um, but it doesn't look good and it makes you feel bad if you're Jewish and you've been taught to identify with Israel. You don't want to identify with Israel and you don't have another Jewish content because that's what's been fed to you. Item number three, the Iraq War. In 2003, a widespread myth was that Jews led America into war because of Israel. Now, Israel was actually against the war. Sharon was leaning on Bush not to do it. But Bush told Sharon to shut up and keep his cabinet quiet. Um, and um, it became that fall and the following winter, for the first time since before World War II, respectable in America to call the Jews a threat to American society. You get the Walton Mearsheimer book, The Israel Lobby, about how Israel and its friends here are leading America over a cliff. Um, Michael, there were so many essays being written in serious mainstream magazines about how Israel and the neocons, and sometimes they just came out and said the Jews, had finagled America into a war that was bad for America. Um, you then go on, the Jewish organizations, I describe what's happened to them, the uh, single issue uh, nature that they've taken on, they, you hardly even hear them on church state issues. You hear them on Israel. They go to war with the administration over the Iran deal. They go to war with the administration over the nomination of Chuck Hagel. Um, they defend the Bush administration as though you can't criticize the White House. We don't do that, we're not political. Then they go to war with the Obama White House because they completely forgot what they'd said a year ago. Um, all of these things, Jewish children, Jewish youth are raised to be liberal. It's the culture that we grow up in. It's the culture that we've created either over the last, remember the first 
election in which Jews voted majority for the Democrat was 1800. The first election where there were parties was the election where Thomas Jefferson was running on church-state separation, freedom of religion, and the Federalists were running on a Christian nation. And ever since then, with a few exceptions, Jews have been Democrats, and they brought that from Europe. It's way before Roosevelt. It's before the great Russian immigration. It's very deeply baked into us. And when the Jewish community asks young Jews, as Peter Beinart wrote a few years ago, to choose between their Zionism or their Judaism, and their liberalism, to everybody's surprise, many of them choose liberalism. And the net effect of this, and here's where I end, will be if, I don't even know if we can do anything about this, but if we can't seize control of the public agenda of the Jewish community, the kids will walk away. And there will be no Jewish, there will be an Orthodox Jewish community in 30 or 40 years. There will be a few hundred thousand Orthodox Jews, and the rest of us will be former Jews. Thank you. It's so much fun moderating panels among the Jews. <laughs> I spend my time doing this and reporting on anti-Semitism. It's a very lively line of work. And a lot of the time, the conversation is, things are bad, they've been bad, and here's how they're going to get worse. <laughs> um, and that is perpetually what the discussion is. And so what I like to do is to try to focus questions when I then ask them on what can we do about it, um, and try to take some of the creativity and talent that are usually on the stage and say, OK, let's put all of that historical knowledge and all of that investment in the Jewish community to work. And so I'm going to start with Shaul, uh, but this will be a theme, I think, for many of my questions. Um, so my question for you is you discussed a sort of deracinated um, Zionist identity from Brandeis to Jared Kushner and David Friedman. Um, and in other places, like in my own uh, publication, Tablet Magazine, you've written about Jewish identity in America being somewhat deracinated, being too focused on Israel and the Holocaust, a concept, an argument presented by the late Jacob Musner that you have advanced. Um, so you have this very far-reaching critique, I can, I can say, of American Jewish consciousness. So my question is, what should American Jewish consciousness be, and how can we build it? Um, obviously, if I had the answer to that, I, I would... Um probably um, be somewhere else, <laughs> making a lot more money. Um, I think, you know, it, it, it's, a, I'm of two minds about this. I think that, and, I, and, and I'm, it's a kind of self-contradiction. On the one hand, I think that one of the things that is missing in America, the American Jewish experience that has, that has existed in previous eras, is that we don't have any really robust, creative Jewish secularism in America. We have a lot of secular Jews, and we have forms of humanistic Judaism. We have certain things, but we don't have. And I don't mean it in terms of Seinfeld or Amy Schumer. Or, I mean something. I mean something. I mean something that would compare to the Jewish secularism that existed in Eastern Europe in the late nineteenth century. Um, that doesn't leave Jews who reject religion as their identity any place to go except Israel and the Holocaust. And Israel and the Holocaust are problematic for two reasons. First of all, again, Israel is the place we choose not to live in. And the Holocaust is something that is slowly becoming um, more history than it is memory. And that's just the nature of events, right? A child born today will likely never know a Holocaust survivor. That's the reality. That's the way millennials think. So on the one hand, we need more of a I think we need to think about creative ways of creating a Jewish secularism. On the other hand, I think we have to think more seriously about what the experience of Jews in the diaspora in a society where anti-Semitism does not define us. It's not to say that it doesn't exist, but it certainly doesn't define us, or I think it shouldn't define us. Right? In that essay on Jacob Neusner, I called it negative Judaism, right? Judaism that is defined by anti-Semitism, I called negative Judaism. But to create a Judaism that is not defined by the anti-Semite, that could be a way of creating a Jewish life that is not simply about supporting the place we don't live in or mourning an event that happened on the, on the other side of the ocean, 
but actually to think seriously about a Jewish future that, by the way, I mean, within, I, I'm not so pessimistic in terms of what JJ said. I think the intermarriage question um, is, is, a, is an opportunity. I think it's an opportunity uh, to do uh, a number of things. And one of the things is that it's an opportunity to reconceive the Jewish community in America as a community that is no longer made up exclusively of Jews. That may be historically unprecedented, at least, I don't know, in terms of ancient history, right? And that is, we already are a community made up of Jews and non-Jews. What would it mean to think creatively about what that means and how Judaism can be expressed in light of that? So I think that, you know, in a certain sense, that's why I'm contradicting myself. On the one hand, I'm saying we need more, uh, we need more Judaism, and the other hand, I'm saying we need more secularism. So Jen, you occupy an interesting slot on this panel because you were brought in, I hope I'm not revealing any secrets here to me, the conservative voice of the panel. Um, but during this past election, um, like many Jewish conservatives, you have been very vocally critical of Donald Trump and his campaign and his allies. And it's continued since his inauguration. Um, and anyone who doubts me can check Jen's Twitter feed for today, um, where she has been rallying support for Congress to reject um, President Trump's executive order on refugees. Um, and as I said, this is uh, sort of a theme in the, in the Jewish conservative community, and particularly among neoconservatives. Brett Stevens of the Wall Street Journal, Bill Crystal of the Weekly Standard, John Horowitz of Commentary. I could go on for a while. And they, these people have suffered tremendous consequences, professionally and personally, because of the stance that they've taken. Um, but my question to you is, um, given the principles you outlined here, you said Jews need to fight for them, and the fact that the party that you belong to, or did belong to, Right, is now the party of Donald Trump. And on the other side, you have the Democratic Party, which none of you can align with either. What is the place for orphaned Jewish conservatives today, and what should they be doing for the next four years? I've been wondering that for a while now. Um, let me, before I get to that, and I will get to that, don't let me forget about you. Yeah. I think something that JJ said is exactly right, and that is that American Jewish experience is entirely different from the organized Jewish community. Your kids may not know the alphabet soup of Jewish organizations. They may never have heard of, I don't know, B'nai B'rath or whatever, because these organizations are essentially hollow shells. They're no longer membership organizations. They are money and public relations organizations, but they don't have an active, um, rich community life. So when I speak of Jews in America, I am not speaking about the organized Jewish community. And in part, I think that's part of the problem, that they have either outlived or forgotten their usefulness, <laughs> and that American Jews actually do have a tremendously rich, vibrant, secular life. It's called politics. And you cannot go anywhere in national politics without a lot of Jews. Um, there is a overrepresentation in Congress, in every organization from the ACLU to the Sierra Club. That is secular Judaism. What has been the mantra of reform and to some extent uh, conservative synagogues in the last decade or so? Tikkun olam. That sort of defines now the American Jewish experience. That's very close to a lot of political causes. And in fact, that's why there's this overlap. There is a natural affinity. So I think what we've been talking about is there is a vibrant secular Jewish experience, it's just not labeled as such. It's not within the confines of these old mainline Jewish organizations, which I think are sort of walking dinosaurs. They're the walking dead. Um, so let me get back to your question. Um, it's not just a Jewish problem. I think it's an American problem that there are a great many people who look to Donald Trump. In fact, there was a majority of American people who looked to Donald Trump and said, not me what he stands for, whether I'm a Jew, whether I'm a African American, whether I'm a Catholic, Hispanic, whatever. He does not represent me, he is not me, he is not American. However, they may not be in tune with a whole panoply 
of individual issues, whether it's what should be our top marginal tax rate or whether we should have, you know, X or Y um, you know, uh, expenditures for public education, there is a disconnect because on one hand, you have, I think, a majority of America who has rejected Trump and Trumpism on a virulent, emotional, um, identity basis, that he is not America. That doesn't tell us anything about the politics. It simply is rejecting what he stands for. So the question is, where do we go, or what do we do? Um, I broke up with the Republican Party in the spring. I didn't realize that it sort of went viral in the uh, Jewish community in uh, the Washington, D.C. area. But I wrote a piece that I'm breaking up with the Republican Party. Um, so I'm over you. Um, that doesn't mean I have a place to go, or does it? Um, I think this is an extraordinary time when we return to sort of first principles of politics, as opposed to a laundry list of agenda items. Defense of the rule of law, tolerance, respect for democratic norms, a free and vibrant press. These are things that have moved up in importance far higher than many of the subsidiary issues, because without those issues, you never get to the subsidiary issues. If you don't have democratic norms, independent court, uh, independent judiciary, a free and vibrant press, you're never gonna get to the issues of environmentalism or social justice or court reform or criminal justice reform or anything else. So I think there is the potential for, because we live in such an extraordinary time, is for a sort of nonpartisan or bipartisan or beyond partisan alliance of people of goodwill and people of good faith. Um, I joke that I have the most interesting <laughs> inbox and interesting uh, Twitter feed of anybody I know. Because on one hand, I have John McCain, and I also have the ACLU. Right now, they're sort of on the same side in a lot of this stuff. So there has to be something that transcends the day-to-day -day because, as I like to say, we are at an all-hands-on-deck point in American democracy. That until we resolve, protect, reinforce certain basic understandings about American democracy, we're not even gonna get to this stuff. I look forward to the day when James Fallows and I disagree again, or when you know, I'm fighting about you know, smaller things, and they are smaller things, because I think we are reaching a crisis point in American democracy. So I think the very long answer to your question is, um, right now, party politics does not interest me as much as defense of democracy and democratic pluralistic politics. And there are ways in which all of us, the most common email I get from people is what can I do? What should I do? Um, and the answer is exactly what was suggested, which is you re-engage with civil society, which is that space between the individual and the government, which is schools, which is civic organizations, which is neighborhood, which is um, the whole life that all of us live, aside from <laughs> yelling at one another in poli about politics. It's the stuff that you don't do when you're working, and it's the stuff you don't do when you're arguing about politics. It's everything else. And that is, I think, the way Jews over the last few decades have expressed their Judaism, concept of tikkun olam, um, and I actually think that's the key to reestablishing democratic norms, um, because it's within that context of community and defense of first principles that we reconnect on a more fundamental level about what it means to be an American, what it means to be a citizen of a pluralistic democracy. So I don't have a party right now. It's okay. Um, I'm on to other things. <laughs> Thank you.
Lilac, you gave something of a pessimistic uh, prediction as to how philanthropy in the Jewish community is going to react to the Trump era. Uh, say tomorrow, you're whisked away in a helicopter and I sit you down in a boardroom with you know, the top 20 mega donors in the American Jewish community. What would you tell them their action plan should be for the Trump presidency? And please give me specifics. It's a dream, you know, you can say anything Oh my you want. God. Spend those endowments. Stop holding on to that money as if it holds a guarantee, right? As if it is the guarantor of survival. I think in the psychology of endowment in, in Jewish philanthropic life, right, and, and what you have to know is that Jewish federations, by and large, in their bylaws, prohibited endowment for decades and decades. Do you know why they prohibited endowment? Because the money was meant to be spent. There were needs every single day, and the money was meant to circulate and go to agencies. Now, does that mean it was a perfect process back in the day? Not at all, right? But the idea was that they would set a ceiling, and they would say, we don't want more than $1 million in reserve funds. We don't want it, because why should we be holding this when there are needs? That started to shift for all sorts of reasons in the 1960s and 1970s. And now, these Jewish organizations value themselves not by the money that they spend, but by the money they hold. And I don't think that is good. And I think it is particularly not good now. But it's going to take a total culture shift, right? It's going to mean saying, you know those donor advised funds that you all hold that constitute about a third of the $18 billion endowment of the National Federation system? Those need to be spent, right? And, and in fact, we need to re-educate people about what the state investment in philanthropy means. And so my advice would be, and you know, I suppose if I had their ear, I would tell them what I think they should spend it on. But the very first thing would be to say, stop holding that money as if it holds the key to the future, because that future is never happening. Right? It is a moving target, always, always, always. And instead, think about enriching the body politic by circulating those assets. Can I just respond to that for a minute? If you haven't already, go upstairs and look around. Gallery after gallery is about Jewish philanthropic organizations throughout American history. Immigrant aid, elderly, burial societies, adult education. There was that rich life before. It's not like this is foreign to the Jewish community. They have to, it's not that you have to reinvent something completely new, they have to go back to their roots. Um, and the number of organizations and the services they provided were essentially a government unto themselves, not unlike Jewish communities of years gone by in Europe where it was a self fulfilling, we have to protect our own, so there was medical services, there were legal services, there was immigrant aid societies, um, and that comes, I guess, with the money. Okay, so we are running low on time and we want to make sure to get to the audience questions, so I have a question for JJ, which I'm then gonna open up to the entire panel, so I'll get two in the way. Um, you told this arresting anecdote about Republican Max Fisher who presides over this convention of rowdy Jewish socialists and pasts this extremely liberal platform and when asked why, said, well, these are my people, as though there is some fundamental connection, right, unifying him with these people, but their political views are disparate. Um, I had an experience recently where somebody I knew who was in Harvard Law School when I was an undergrad called me up, and this is a guy who was extremely successful, very, very intelligent, had gone on to a very prestigious law firm, and he says to me, I don't think I'm doing what I should be doing. This is not the important thing to be doing. Um, I want to leave you know, the private sector and go and do something for the Jewish community. Right? What should I be doing? You write about this stuff, you are in this world, what is the thing I should do? Um, and so, before I tell you what I said, the first part of the question is, what would all of you say, starting with you, JJ? Um, and the reason why this relates specifically to your question, though, is the second part, which is what I answered him, he said, invest in a project that unifies Jews, that brings all of the Jews, all the Jewish stakeholders together. Um, and the challenge, it's easy to say, the challenge is, is that the things that used to do this for the Jewish community, whether it was Soviet Jewry or Israel, do not exist anymore. And in some cases, like Israel, actually actively fracture 
in the American Jewish community. So I suggested to him, personally, you know, working on some sort of alliance to organize American Jews to spotlight and combat rising anti-Semitism in Europe, and taking young American Jews to visit their compatriots in Paris who are living and breathing Jews and not just seeing dead ones in Poland. Right? And this was a suggestion I gave to because that's something that from the left to the right, Orthodox, right, to reform, secular, to religious, all Jews can get behind saying, we as privileged American Jews should be raising you know, this issue and using our ability to help our brethren in Europe. Um, that was my suggestion. So my question is, one, what would you tell a person saying, what should I do to help the Jewish community? And two, what are unifying projects, if any, that exist that you see that are understaffed and need work right now? I would start by saying um, we don't need unity right now. We don't agree on things. We disagree on very fundamental things. Um, Half the Jews in America think that anti-Semitism is a big problem, the other half don't. Um, we're pretty much split down the middle on, um, on Israel. On abortion, we're 90% in favor. The thing that unites us is abortion. <laughs> I'm not joking. I'm not joking. There was a fascinating survey. This is a question that's rarely asked in Jewish surveys because Jewish surveys are run by Jewish organizations that know what they want to hear. Um, but the Workman Circle ran a survey three years ago, and um, they asked how Jews felt about various American political issues. Gay rights, um, civil rights, immigration rights, um, gender rights, abortion rights, 80 to 90 percent agreement on liberal stances. Um, that, the idea that because 10 percent don't agree, therefore we shouldn't talk about it, makes no sense to me. Um, now, surprisingly, on questions like in a labor dispute, is your first sympathy with the union or the manager, 60% say union. Um, should taxes on the wealthy be higher in order to help support the poor, 65% say yes. In other words, there is a difference between Jewish attitudes on social issues and Jewish attitudes on socioeconomic issues, class issues. But what it, the difference is that there's about 20% of the Jewish community that's liberal on the social issues, but not on the class issues. I would say the 20% of the Jewish community that is wealthy and liberal and runs the community because it's their gifts that manage it, don't want to hear. They're not interested in you. Now, the thing that what elected Trump first and foremost, well, it's two things. One is the um, anger of the white working class and that's all over the Western world. People who, from the government, they get nothing. From their jobs, they get less and less. And from the left that's supposed to be on their side, they hear how they're privileged, how they're prejudiced, how they stink. I mean, the, the policy of the American left these days is, you stink, you're a bigot, you're horrible, so vote for me. And um, we are in favor of minorities, so they go to the majority. Um, it's possible to be in favor of, when the, the uh, Roosevelt coalition, the New Deal coalition, was led by these economic issues, by labor, and it pulled Jews and blacks and others in its train. When those secondary issues became the primary issues, the coalition died. Ever since then, ever since those minority rights issues, became the primary focus of the Democratic Party, the Republican Party has dominated American politics. Now, the, the revolt, it, it would take, first of all, people who are, um, Republicans who couldn't stomach Trump voted for either write-in candidates or one of the third party candidates, Gary Johnson. Those votes, those people voted for Trump. Trump was elected by the Republicans who couldn't bring themselves to vote for Hillary Clinton. The people who are out in the street now saying Trump is going to take away women's rights are guaranteeing his future because when you focus on what's wrong with him being the things that make him a Republican, as though being a Republican were illegitimate on abortion, on immigration, on these issues where America really is split on what we define as legitimate issues. If you take sides on that, rather than what Jen was talking about, talk about democracy, about rule of law, about fairness and in institutions, um, and leave the other stuff for later after the crisis has passed, or mention it second. So we all have lost sight of the central issues in American politics. 
What should the Jewish agenda be? It should be fine. Now, when the Jewish community was vibrant, as Jen was describing, in the, in the teens and 20s and before that, it was serving the self-interests of American Jews. Today, wealthy liberals are, it's a politics of generosity, helping somebody else other than yourself. What are the common interests of American Jews? How many Jews are poor? How many Jews have gender issues? What are the things that could unite the Jewish community around its own self-interest? Not Israel, not anti-Semitism, because most of us don't experience it. It's one of these things you have to maintain, but it's not the primary issue. Certainly not Soviet, it's us. It's our lives in this country. Define, a, what, the, what should this guy be doing? He should be going to work with a bunch of scholars and form a think tank to figure out what do American Jews need to demand from American society today? What should the Jewish community stand for? Do you want us to answer? Please. Um, well, so as JJ suggested, I think he should give his money to some scholars um, to <laughs> think about it, right? So we are here, and I hope he's in the audience. No, I, I, you know, look, right now, what do I think he should be doing? I think he should be out on the street protesting, <laughs> honestly. That's what he should be doing, and I agree with JJ. It's not about the policies. It's not about the issues now. It's about the Constitution. It's about what it means for a leader to be in place who is not uh, producing the documents that enable us to know whether he's violating our Constitution and thus undermining our democracy. And I think every Jewish person should be out worrying about that because without the sanctity of our Constitution and without that framework for our democracy, it will be impossible to be a Jew or a successful, decent human being here. Um, I agree entirely. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there we go. That's why she reads me. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of the, the tenor of our times. One thing I would say, and I think the person who best expresses this is actually Joe Biden um, on what the Democratic Party should be. You know, everyone sort of mocks him for, you know, the guy from Scranton and Lunchbox Joe. But he has the ability not to abandon issues of gay rights or um, identity politics, if you will, but to put them into a broader context. Um, and I think that's the way forward, um, frankly, for um, American politics in general, to connect on those things which we identify with. After we save the democracy, then we can work on the things that actually um, unite us. Um, but I do think um, that American Jews um, simply um, don't necessarily proclaim themselves to be in a Jewish activity when they are marching in the street, when they're filing a lawsuit as an ACLU lawyer. They are Jewish and they are doing it because of their Jewish identity, but they don't do it under the banner of the Jewish community. Okay, I'm gonna make it very, very fast, because uh, I know that um, you wanna open up to the audience. So, five things, very quickly. <laughs> I had 10, but I cut it down. Number one, um, give up on the notion of Jewish unity. I think it's a myth. I think it's a golden calf. I think it never, I don't think it exists. I don't think it ever did exist, and I don't think it should exist. Number two, um, own your identity as an American and as a Jew, not as somehow second class, but as first class. Number three, don't let anti-Semitism define you. Number four, if you want to be a Zionist, please, please, please learn something about Zionism. And if you don't want to be a Zionist, don't think that you're being less of a Jew for not being a Zionist. That's it. Take a couple questions. There are people going around with microphones. Um, so raise your hand and they will find you. It's almost there. I think it's also for the recording. So. Okay, there's two points that I think would be problematic if two statements were not challenged. Uh, number one from Shaul Magid regarding evangelical Christians. And last night I had the honor of having dinner with uh, Emeritus President of Friends of Israel Ministries, 
And I've worked with evangelicals, I've worked with Catholics, I've worked with Jewish communities in six states for the Israeli consulate since 2004 to 2013. And what I would pose is that for evangelicals, in their kishkas, they have a love for Jews, not just for Israel, because in order to understand themselves, they're learning that they have to understand their roots. That's number one. And to J.J. Goldberg, um, this morning I was with my 91-year-old uh, mother-in-law who was, came, brought her five kids from Cairo, Egypt. And um, you mentioned young adults and, and the future, and you quoted Pew, and you quoted the 60% and when Stephen M. Cohen spoke at Gratz College a few years back about, about Pew, I, he, I wanted to speak with him. He invited me to come to New York to talk with him. He said, what most people don't understand is the grandchildren have only an 8% identification rate. So with that opening, I would say that your statement of 750,000 expelled, expelled from Israel for my mother-in-law it is such a statement that these who have no concept of what's going on accept and it, it gives power to their negative feelings towards Israel. And I have a bias because I work for the state of Israel. Thank you. If, you want, if people want to respond, but if they feel like they want to go to the next question, that's okay. Let me just say on the last point, my point was not that the expulsion or the exodus of the Arab refugees in 1948 defines Israel or should define Israel. My point was that that's the perception that is gaining ground on American campuses and our kids don't know how to answer it. I gave you one of the answers and by the I don't, statement. you don't need to give me the answer. You need no, no, to give no, no. those kids in college the answer. I know. And I was Can I, can I, uh, yeah, a couple, uh, okay. okay, while they're going to the next question. While they're going to the next question, just very briefly. I'm sure there are evangelical Christians that love Jews. But uh, as opposed to what became popular in, in mainline Protestantism in the 1980s, this notion of a two covenant theology, evangelical Christianity does not have a two covenant theology. There is Christianity. Judaism is simply obsolete. Now, they may love Jews and they may love Israel, but Looking at the theology upon which those evangelicalities build their lives, Judaism is simply something that has no future. That's all. That's actually not entirely accurate. And in fact, the major evangelical movements that are very involved in Israel do not have a replacement theology. Um, they represent and support Jews. Citing Genesis, um, he blesses Israel, shall be blessed. Um, so they absolutely do believe in two covenants. Uh, uh, that's, that's <laughs> Can we go back to the point counterpoint there? But I don't know if it's going to really go any. It's going to go south very quickly. So. Yeah, I feel like I, this is a conversation that people can come right, up afterwards and right. if, if they want you in a smaller okay. group. But uh, how much time do we have for, like, how much time do we have left, would you say? Do you have a couple more questions? One more question? Two. Two more questions. Make it three. <laughs> so. Let's see, do we have someone with the microphone already? Or? Uh, you know what, let's do, sorry, I wanna make sure we get a question in front of us. Let's go here, can we do three questions? We can do three. Let's just hear them all first. I'll be very brief, thank, thank you very much. Um, it seems to me that everyone on the panel agrees that we're at a very critical moment for the fate of, the health and fate of American democracy. And um, I'd really like to ask each of you, what do you really think is the most important thing for people to do. I'm not sure that saying be involved in your local community, which is, you know, you're, you're depicting it as a civil sphere in between the, the state and our private lives. Um, I'm not sure if that's the final word on it. So I just want to ask each of you directly, what do you really think is the most important thing we can do okay. right now to save American democracy? Let's take two more and then we'll let the panelists answer them all together. I, I'm somewhat confused with your emphasis on endowments as a real problem. If the endowments are already given, I don't know that the agency has the ability to change it unless the donor agrees. But are you saying that the endowments in some way restrict their uh, political stance? I mean, uh, uh, the endowments are there. Maybe, maybe they should instead ask for 
uh, unrestricted donations, but the endowments are there. What, what can they do about them, and what is their real importance in uh, affecting the way Jews react to things? From 2006 through the eight years of President Obama, the three most significant things that occurred on the right had very little to do with the Republican Party. One was the Tea Party. The other one was Donald Trump's emergence. And the third one, as was mentioned from the stage, was the growth of blue collar people voting for Donald Trump. Now my question is, if we look at the map of the United States, and if you take away huge cities and college campuses where we see some of the worst anti-Semitism, how do you explain that? Because the argument should not be against the Republican Party, because as I said, the three things that occurred had nothing to do with the establishment, and maybe, just like the press, you are missing the point based upon your own blind spots. Great, so now I will allow the panelists to handle all of these wonderful questions. Well, on the last point, silence is consent. So, um, it, it, silence is consent. Um, so they, they did, they, they lent their party apparatus to Donald Trump. They are Donald Trump and they bear the responsibility. Um, I don't blame the victims. Um, uh, very briefly, what should you do? Um, some people are meant to run for public office. Other people are meant to be lobbyists. Other people are meant to be uh, writers. You have to find your highest talent and go all in um, and make a commitment to yourself and to your fellow Americans that that's what you're gonna do for the next year. So maybe it's going to work for a political candidate. Maybe it's getting on the phone every single day with your member of Congress, um, but you have to re-engage in politics in a way you may not have done since you were in college. I don't think we have no objection to that. That's exactly what Republicans did when Barack Obama was elected. He emerged from a groundswell. And I applaud him for doing that. I have no problem. What I'm saying, however, is, again, maybe you're missing the point, and maybe there's a lot of Americans out there that have shown themselves that are not connected in that way with Donald Trump not the Republican power play, nor was the Tea Party, nor were all those people, the former Democrats, who helped them win Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania. Okay, so this is an interesting question, but also it's a little bit of far afield from the topic of the panel, which is talking about the state of the union of Jewish politics, America, Israel today. And so we could relitigate the election for a very, very long time. It will be, I think, for many years to come. Uh, but let's go focus back on the questions. I think it was a question about philanthropy for life. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the very short answer is that um, I think the issue is what happens to the money that's now in endowment, right? Some of it is restricted by certain, you know, legal, legally binding restrictions on it, but much of it is not, including the money in donor advised funds, which in the Jewish philanthropic world make up at least a third, possibly more of the assets of the, the corpus of, of endowment. And so it's a, a kind of culture shift, not only in how the money is raised and what the asks are about, but also in terms of how the money that's already held is spent. So, so that would be the short answer. And I just wanted to say two other things to, to different questions and comments. Um, the first is that I think we need to have a really serious discussion about our assumptions of anti-Semitism on campus, right? That, that this is the problem. I, I work at a university. Is there sometimes things, are there sometimes things that happen at the university that might be classified as anti-Semitic? Sure. Is that the kind of anti-Semitism right now that we need to be worrying about? No. Thank you. So stop. All of you who have children in college, all of you who have grandchildren in college, stop assuming that that is the conversation about anti-Semitism. The conversation about anti-Semitism right now is Stephen Bannon. And the other thing I wanted to say is what should you be doing right now? I will give you a directive, I will give you a call to action. 
every single day, get on the phone, write a postcard, and pressure your members of Congress to hold hearings about the emoluments clause. That's the constitutional issue having to do with Trump's business holdings in foreign countries and the potential violation of the Constitution. Uh, I, just, I just really simply want to add a footnote to what Lila said. It's kind of what I wanted to say, but she said it a lot better than I was going to say it. But I want to add another point. I think that, that there's been a very strong push within the, within the institutional Jewish community that is um, erasing any separation between critique of Israel and anti-Semitism. And that's part of the problem. And I think that one of the things that the, as, as I, was, I wasn't going to say Stephen Bannon, I was going to say people like, Stephen, like, like Robert Spencer, who's further, further on the margins, but so much energy in the American community is worried about anti-Semitism of the left and completely ignoring the anti-Semitism on the right. And the anti-Semitism of the right doesn't care about Israel. The anti-Semitism of the right is actually pro-Israel, right? Spencer is pro-Israel. The anti-Semitism of the right has a problem with Jews. So one thing to do is to recognize there is, even if you don't agree with it, there is a legitimate critique of Israel's policies. A legitimate critique. You might not agree with it. You can have the argument. A critique of Israel's policies is not, by definition, anti-Semitism. Can I... Um, the, I <coughs> We're, we're separating white from black where it's, the reality is gray. There is a problem on campus. It may not be that Jews are threatened. I don't think Jews are being threatened on campus. I do think that young Jews are being scared away from their Judaism. And I... <laughs> I go around to a lot of... I don't teach on college campus, but I travel a lot, and kids approach me all the time. And they say, what are we supposed to do? What's that? David Bessel was struck at Temple That is a complicated case, sir. They're all complicated. So, at this, at this is a great subject. Unfortunately, we can't. Oh, it's unfortunate that it's coming up at the end about. of the panel when we Make can't sure. talk about it in detail. Sure. Um, I can say that I'm going to pull a weird rank in this panel and just say that this is my peer group and that it is a real issue on campus. It's not every campus. It's often exaggerated by outside groups with agendas. Right, and I experienced that myself on a campus as an undergraduate, but also as a reporter and as an undergraduate, I experienced the real thing. And we need sophisticated people talking about this in a sophisticated way. And the problem is the conversation is often unsophisticated in very, as you said, black and white terms. Um, and I'd like to think that the stuff that people on this stage write will help demystify these things and have a more sophisticated conversation about understanding the issue. The point is that they're both real. Yes, and exactly. one is a threat against Jews, and the other is an undermining of Jewish identity, but they're both real. And the second one, Jewish identity, may be the more important one for our future as a community. And I also like to just say, sometimes people can debate, is left wing anti semitism worth the right wing? Is right now the one we should be fighting this or that? I always tell people it's just a false choice, and in general, you should be fighting the anti semitism that's coming out of your community that you identify with, because that's where you can have the most impact. It's a lot easier to talk about anti semitism as the perpetual sin of other people try to talk about it as something that you need to work on in your own community, and if we all did that together, I think we'd get somewhere. Now with that, I'm going to hand <laughs> With it back that, I will thank our panelists and our moderator for a really lively and thought-provoking conversation.